a large tanker planned a river passage at night in Europe. The river pilot boarded at 2 a.m. and was handed the pilot card. There was a brief discussion with the master and the voyage began. The master then said he was going to his cabin for a short while. He was unwell and had been on the bridge for most of the last 24 hours. Under local regulations, the vessel had right of way because of the flood tide and its size indicated by lights. The ship's position was plotted regularly. The watch changed at 4 a.m. The pilot was in frequent contact with the shore. He spoke in the local language, which was not understood by anyone else on the bridge. Interaction between him and the bridge team was minimal. The master fell asleep in his cabin. At 5 a.m., the ship began negotiating a difficult right-hand bend in the river. During this, the ship moved to the center of the channel to make room for an overtaking ship to starboard. Exiting the bend, the ship was now on the far port side of the channel. Fog descended, reducing visibility to 200 meters. Another tanker was coming the other way. There was a long conversation between the pilots of the two tankers, but no one else understood what was being said. No one asked the pilot any questions. The master was not called to the bridge. The approaching ship failed to appreciate the right of way of the first tanker, and the two ships collided. The collision resulted in significant damage to both ships, but fortunately, there was no loss of life or pollution. It could have been very different. Recent research has indicated that 90% of all ship casualties occur in restricted or pilotage waters, and that 60% of these accidents occur with a pilot on board. It is the job of the pilot, using local knowledge, to direct the navigation of the ship through the potentially hazardous waters during port approach, berthing and departure. The pilot brings three important types of expertise to the bridge team. First, knowledge of the local traffic, current, tides and the hazards to navigation. Second, greater experience in handling ships and tugs in their port. Third, familiarity and common language with the shore-based support services, such as port authorities, vessel traffic services and tugs. The bridge team know their ship and how it handles. They have a voyage plan. They need to combine their knowledge with the pilots to get the best from the pilot and comply with their obligations under the STCW convention. How to do this is the subject of this video. The first step is preparing properly the boarding arrangements. The boarding ladder must be in good repair. The ropes must not be fitted with shackles nor have any knots or splices. The IMO requirements for boarding arrangements are set out in the International Maritime Pilots Association card Required Boarding Arrangements for Pilot. My ATA to pilot station is 1400, 1400, my maximum draft. The bridge must find out the deck height of the pilot launch and on which side it is required before the pilot boat arrives. 
The ladder can then be made the right length and put on the correct side. The pilot station or pilot boat will ask the ship for a specific speed for boarding. An accurate ETA, with updates if necessary, must be provided. On the bridge, the pilot card and any other required documentation should be prepared. If necessary, the bridge should be tidied up. If necessary, the deck should be cleared too. The pilot will be looking around and the first judgments can shape the working relationship. There must be a responsible officer standing by in radio communication with the bridge. This will usually be the watch-keeping officer. The bridge should do what they can to make boarding easy for the pilot. The ship should always provide a lee. There must be a lifebuoy with lifeline in position. A line and canvas bag should be ready to bring on board the pilot's bag if required. Pilots estimate that between 5 and 10% of ships do not provide the proper means of boarding. But they rarely complain for fear of jeopardizing the relationship with the bridge team. But it gets the relationship off to a bad start. Once the pilot is safely on board, the officer greets him and informs the bridge. The bridge should then inform the engine room. That's the end of this section. Now look at the workbook. To get the best from a pilot, the bridge team needs to establish a good working relationship. A warm welcome to the bridge always helps. Are we all finished cargo here? Come on. Uh, still a few boxes to load. But then the pilot may want a few minutes to gain situational awareness before the master pilot exchange. The first step is to give the pilot the pilot card. The pilot card should be left available to the pilot throughout the passage. Have we got hazardous cargo today? Yes, we do, yeah. The first step is to agree a language that both the pilot and bridge team understand. This will probably be English. The objective is to agree the voyage plan and contingency procedures. So what, what the sequence is, we, we're on the berth here, we'll move from the berth here, through this area here, into the lock. It should be an open two-way discussion. Why, why do we uh, just one tug in the river? That's where the tide comes across the entrance in um, quite quickly. And also, the pilot is a fellow professional and deserves your trust. Remember, honesty is the best foundation for a good working relationship. Teamwork is impossible without open communication. The watch keeping officer should take the opportunity to speak to the pilot so that communication is not just between the master and the pilot. Next, the pilot will want to know if there's any equipment that is not functioning or anything that could affect the normal handling of the ship. Everything working, Captain? Uh, yes, it is. The pilot must be told the truth. Bath thruster is it working? Yes, uh, 2,200 horsepower. It's better for the pilot to find out about any problems now rather than halfway through a manoeuvre. So just uh, fixed. Fixed pitch. Fixed pitch, yeah. Right handed. She's right handed. Yeah. It must be agreed who will manoeuvre the ship and who will operate the engine, thrusters, and helm. If the master intends to operate the thrusters himself, he must follow the pilot's instructions. So, come to that. So, can we confirm the draft then, please? Okay. Yes, 10 metres. 10 metres, even ten, keel. 10 metres, even keel, okay. But at the moment, our, our scheduled time. We have, we've got it's essential the master and pilot discuss and agree the ship's intended track, anticipated speeds, and ETA. That's per there. If we stick to roughly those timings, that's the estimated under keel clearance that, right. we, that we've got. When coming into a port, it's possible that the berth is not yet known. 
It's also possible that the pilot has their own voyage plan based on local knowledge. We'll keep her a little bit. This may be on a laptop. Usual, and then I will steer on Ultramar, so that's going to give a good lead to the pilots. Okay. And there's no traffic downbound. No downbound, thank no, you. Nothing. Once the plan has been agreed, the master should tell the bridge team what has been decided. So, as we're going out, if there's any ships coming in, then get onto VTS and they tell us where we're going to meet. If there's any Communications with vessel traffic services need to be agreed. If time allows, arrangements with tugs should be discussed. Okay. Right, Captain, have you got any questions? Uh, wind conditions are okay for uh, entering the lock? Yeah, we've got the wind at the moment. The pilot should be asked if there are any unusual weather, tide or traffic conditions that could affect the voyage. Once these issues have been discussed and agreed, any master pilot exchange documentation required by company or other procedures can be signed. The master should always offer the pilot the choice of the ship's radars and inform him how they're set up. The pilot will probably want one of them set up to his own specifications. The pilot should be reminded that the bridge team cannot have good situational awareness if the pilot is using a language they don't understand to talk to port authorities and tugs. Pilots must relay the contents of these discussions to the bridge team. So when we go into the river... Even if time is short, it's essential to have these discussions. The bridge team will then be able to monitor the progress of the voyage along the agreed track. That's the end of this section. Now look at the workbook. The time that the pilot takes over the navigation should be logged. The pilot should also make a formal verbal statement such as, I have the con, which will be recorded by the voyage data recorder. The pilot is responsible for issuing orders on navigation and manoeuvres, but the master remains in overall command. The STCW convention is very clear. Despite the duties and obligations of a pilot, his presence on board does not relieve the master or officer in charge of the watch from their duties and obligations for the safety of the ship. The watchkeeping officer should ask the pilot what the bridge team can do in support. The bridge team should do everything they can to work together with the pilot. The helmsman should be told to follow the pilot's orders. Orders given by the pilot should always be repeated as standard procedure. Two eight zero. Two eight zero. Slow ahead, please. Slow ahead. Two eight zero. Two eight zero. Once the pilot has the con, the bridge team should watch and check their ship handling. The pilot may be unfamiliar with the type of ship. Never assume that a pilot is a good ship handler. Then there's the way that the pilot deals with the bridge team. Are they clear and precise in their orders? Are the team's questions answered appropriately? The watchkeeping officer and master must check that the helmsman is carrying out the pilot's orders. The helmsman may not be able to understand the pilot's commands. They may need to translate or repeat the order. The watchkeeping officer must continue to monitor the ship's position, take and plot fixes and instruct the lookouts. 
The pilot must never be left without support on the bridge. If the ship is in confined or congested waters, the master should remain on the bridge. If the master has to leave the bridge, very clear instructions must be given as to when to be called. The watchkeeping officer then takes over the responsibility of monitoring the pilot. Even if the pilot seems fully competent, every master and watchkeeping officer should maintain a good situational awareness of where the ship is going. They should ask themselves, if the pilot made a mistake, would I spot it? To do this, they must know the constraints of the pilotage area they're sailing through. They must be monitoring the progress of the ship and thinking ahead. It's good practice to keep a conversation going with the pilot so that any concerns can be raised early. If any of the bridge team believes that the ship is getting into danger, the pilot should be asked about their intentions. If the master is not on the bridge, he should be called immediately. The watchkeeping officer must not fear questioning the pilot about anything that was not agreed in the master-pilot exchange. The master must be given time to assess the situation and react if necessary. The master will discuss the situation with the pilot in a calm, professional and non-confrontational way. Raising the issue early gives time for any misunderstanding to be sorted out. The master has the right to take over at any time. Such circumstances will be rare, but the bridge team must always be prepared for them. Officers must never allow a situation to develop where they are unhappy with the pilot's navigation, but can do nothing about it because they don't know what should be happening. Pilots should welcome assistance from the bridge team, but experience will have taught them not always to expect it. Good two-way communication is the key to a safe and successful voyage under pilotage. That's the end of this section. Now, look at the workbook. The most critical part of the voyage is berthing. It's absolutely essential for the bridge team to know the pilot's intentions. Uh, the time boat is not required, so we have no time. Yeah. And the is... If there was not time before, the berthing plan and arrangements with the tugs must be discussed now. There are many issues that need to be resolved, such as how the tugs are to be used, the ship's approach speed, the effect of wind and tide, and which side will be quayside. If the master does not understand what the pilot is saying to the tugs, he should ask the pilot to translate as agreed during the master-pilot exchange. The bridge team should never forget that they must know what is happening and be aware of the ship's intended track. They must have kept up with developments and be aware of the traffic and environmental situation around them. Um, is your bow thruster working, is it? Bow thruster's working. Uh, that's good, so we only need uh, two... Keep to what was agreed about operating the thrusters during the master pilot exchange. Masters must resist trying their own manoeuvres, as these may conflict with the pilots. 
If there is good two-way communication between the pilot and the bridge team, conflict will be avoided and the ship is much more likely to reach the berth safely. A good relationship between the pilot and the bridge team is the best basis for a safe passage through busy, confined and potentially hazardous waters. Every master will have developed their own way of dealing with pilots. Pilots similarly will have developed their individual ways of working with masters. Both sides require tact, honesty and mutual respect to form a good working relationship as quickly as possible. The ship must ensure that the arrangements for boarding are safe and what the pilot expects. The task of the pilot is to navigate the ship and the task of the bridge team is to support the pilot and monitor the voyage. They must maintain a good situational awareness of the ship's position and intended track. If the watchkeeping officer is in doubt, the pilot should be asked about their intentions. Pilots need to know if any of the ship's equipment is not working properly. The bridge team must always bear in mind that the presence of the pilot on the bridge does not relieve them of their responsibilities. There are great dangers associated with over-reliance on pilots. Pilots generally take great pride in their work. Their fellow professionals, who, in the great majority, need the help and deserve the respect of the bridge team. And treating them with yeah, respect the thing, is the yeah. best way to get them to work yeah. well with the bridge team. No it helps ensure a safe voyage through the pilotage area. Remember to treat pilots in the same way that you would like to be treated if you were doing their job. To refresh and improve your knowledge, watch this video again and read the workbook.